Support for today's podcast comes from Cricket Wireless. Are you looking for a way to end summer on a high note? They've got just the thing. Get ready for unlimited smiles, unlimited times four. Get four lines of unlimited data for $100 a month. Please note that Cricket Core is required on four lines. Data speed limited to three megabits per second. Cricket may slow data speeds when the network is busy. Additional fees, usage, and restrictions apply. The Therapy for Black Girls podcast, a weekly conversation about mental health, personal development, and all the small decisions we can make to become the best possible versions of ourselves. I'm your host, Dr. Joy Harden Bradford, a licensed psychologist in Atlanta, Georgia. For more information or to find a therapist in your area, visit our website at therapyforblackgirls.com. While I hope you love listening to and learning from the podcast, it is not meant to be a substitute for a relationship with a licensed mental health professional. Hey, y'all. Thanks so much for joining me for session 174 of the Therapy for Black Girls podcast. All month long, we've been having conversations on our social media channels to celebrate sex positivity in an effort to normalize conversations about sexuality and pleasure. And we're capping this month off with our sex positive September celebration this coming Friday night. We'll be joined by some of your favorite guests from the podcast and other special guests for some fun and conversations about things like exploring your kinks, how colorism might be impacting your orgasms, and how to feel more affirmed in exploring pleasure. Grab your tickets to join us at sexpositiveseptember.com. And in line with that event coming up this week, today we have an amazing guest joining us to talk about how we can engage in more sex-positive thinking throughout our lives. Today, we're joined by Tanya Bass, also known as the Southern Sexologist. Tanya is the founder of the North Carolina Sexual Health Conference, NC SexCon, which is North Carolina's only conference that provides opportunities for agencies and individuals to share information, strategies, and best practices around sexual health across the lifespan. Tanya is committed to increasing health equity and is pursuing her Ph.D. at Widener University in Human Sexuality Studies. Tanya and I chatted about some of the lesser-known areas of sex we should be exploring, what it means to be asexual or aromantic, how to discuss your sexual health history with a partner, and she shares some of her favorite resources for anyone who wants to dig in more. If something really resonates with you while enjoying our conversation, please share it with us on social media using the hashtag TBG in session. Here's our conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today, Tanya. Thank you. I'm excited and glad to be here. Yeah, so you are affectionately known as the Southern Sexologist. Yes, that's like my brand name and I love it. It took me a few years to develop it and decide on it, actually, based on some of the ideas around being a Southerner Mm -hmm. and what that looks like. And I'm originally from Brooklyn, but my family's from North Carolina. So it was also like, is this part of my identity? And I said, I think, yes, I've been living here long enough. I'm definitely into that. And so I started my work actually from a prevention lens in sexuality, doing work around HIV, STI, information and education. And then literally, I remember the year in 2003, I finished my master's and I started working on a project for persons living with HIV and AIDS to talk about intimacy and sensuality and disclosing realizing, you know, just because you have a diagnosis of conditions such as HIV or AIDS doesn't mean you stop being a sexual being. And so like all my worlds collided because here I was challenging aspects of my prevention side 
with aspects around holistic approach to sexuality. And so fast forward, just adopted the name Southern Sexologist when I fully committed to doing work that was more sex positive and embracing sexuality throughout the lifespan. Mm -hmm. So that's a really interesting point that you bring up, just the idea of even talking about sex as a Southerner, right? And, you know, I think that the discussion around sex and sexuality can be difficult for lots of different people, but it definitely feels like there's something about being in the South that makes it even more taboo. Can you talk a little about that? Absolutely. You know, so my family is originally from Eastern North Carolina. That's where our family roots are. And so we have been challenged both in my immediate family and then cousins around talking about sex, sexuality, growing up in a Christian household. Like I literally walked to church when I moved to North Carolina. That's how like the church was across the street from my house. And while I appreciate some of the values and the impact that my church and my religion had on my life, it was also some of the ways that I was challenged in my own worldview around sex and sexuality. And even though I didn't have words for it at a young age, some things that I would hear wouldn't feel right in my body. And it just made me feel sad. And I didn't know why until later. And so in my family, again, we had persons, family members, cousins who passed away from HIV and AIDS in the 80s and the 90s. And no one would talk about it. It was just so taboo. And it's kind of like once you put two and two together, you realize what was happening. And then when you try to talk to somebody about it, they wouldn't want to talk to you about it, even as a professional. So to this day, there's two people who passed away in my family that a subset of my family will not talk about the cause of their death. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, so it, it definitely does feel like some of those kind of religious backgrounds intertwine with these conversations that even makes it more difficult to discuss. And I, yeah. and I think religion is a, a core element of the South. And I think there's a lot of historical aspects of like, why is that even true? But then I also think about when I say Southerner, kind of like that idea of prim and properness and what you should be talking like. What are the words that are coming out of your mouth in public? So what are the topics that are appropriate to be talking about, whether it's in school or church or even in your home in front of other people who aren't your immediate family? Hmm. Very good point. And that kind of reminds me of something you said earlier, just the idea of a more holistic approach to sex education. So can you talk a little bit about that? Right. So the way I look at it, and there's a model entitled The Circles of Sexuality. It was made most famous by Dr. Dennis Daly, but he wasn't the originator of this model. And some people don't like it, but I think it's a good way to start. And I like to use it when I'm teaching and for myself is that, you know, we are sexual beings across different aspects. And this model has five areas, which include sensuality, intimacy, sexual and reproductive health, sexualization, and then sexual identity. And I think as we go through our lives and through development, we probably get the most information on sexual health and reproduction. And even that has its limitations. You know, you might learn about body parts and birth control and STI prevention, et cetera. You know, it's kind of confined there. But oftentimes we don't talk about how our senses bring us pleasure. You know, like when you taste something really good, and I love when people say something is better than sex, because honestly it might be for them, but you know, something tastes so good. It brings you so much pleasure or hearing something that can resonate and make you feel good. So ultimately, we have to look at sex from those different areas. So including our senses. Another area I don't think we talk about is intimacy. I often ask my class, like, how do you think somebody might get catfished? And they're like, I can't believe that someone would fall for that. But we don't really talk about the desire that people have for intimacy and not just physical intimacy, like that, just a connection with your friends, with your family. The reason why so many people are like glued to even social media now is because they're not able to physically be with folks, but they can connect socially and have intimate conversations even on social media. And then sexualization, we probably talk about that next after sexual and reproductive health because we do want to protect each other, especially children, from predators, et cetera. And we tend to always talk about sexualization too from that negative side of like sexual assault, sexual abuse. But there's some good sides to it, like flirting and, you know, 
just using power dynamics in your intimate partner relationship. So I love that model. I know there probably are other models out there, but I think it helps us look at it from the time we're born until the time we die. We're sexual beings and that's the wholeness of us. Okay. So I think you covered four of the circles. Was there a fifth one? Oh, oh, the fifth one is important too, sexual identity. Because I yes. think that's that's the one that says, who am I? How do I show up? How do I want to be seen or perceived? And how and things we can't control is how do people see and perceive us? So like our expression, sexual identity. So not to go on so much, I think about you asking me about Southern roots. So when I think about sexual identity, so I'm old school. And when I was in college, it was like boys to men era. And I had like baggy pants. I literally went into the air quotations men's department and purchased ties on sales and button downs. And I wore baseball caps. And I remember going home on one of our college breaks. And one of my classmates friends was like, why do you always wear those ball caps? You better not come home again after being in college, wearing a ball cap. And I was thinking, why didn't she like what I have on? But she was really addressing my gender identity and my gender expression. Because for her, I was presenting in a masculine way. You know, a young lady shouldn't dress like that. So she actually came for me during that time. And it stuck with me about if we believe in the binary or subscribe to that, it's kind of like, maleness and femaleness and how you show up in the world you get to choose that you get to you get to express yourself the way you want to express yourself Mm -hmm. yeah I appreciate you sharing this model so this is not a model that I was familiar with and I agree it definitely sounds like it's a good place to start and I'm wondering if you have some thoughts about how we can maybe start with these circles and like what kinds of things we should be thinking about or even what kinds of things we should be talking with little people about just in terms of like beginning to embrace all of these different circles related to our, you know, pleasure and sexuality. Right. And the circles, if you think about the model, they're not just like single circles, you know, outside of their own, they kind of overlap each other. Mm -hmm. And so I think talking with young people, I had to pick three, I probably would go sexual and reproductive health, probably intimacy and sensuality. I would like to talk about, you know, one of my colleagues uses a difference between some tickling, like playing, being able to play touch with somebody, but then what is considered inappropriate touch or touch without your consent. So I think understanding that some touch is going to feel good to you, even if you don't want to, even if you don't want to be tickled, you still might laugh because it felt good or it made you laugh but you didn't consent to it. You didn't want to be tickled, like understanding those boundaries and also understanding what it means to feel good. So if you get this ice cream, I love ice cream. And I just think about (laughs) like how good it feels to get a cone or a cup of ice cream that tastes really good and the joy that it brings. You don't have to tell your child, oh, this is sexual pleasure. We can say, yeah, it's pleasure. You like ice cream. You really like ice cream and have conversations about What else do you like? So that they can start thinking about what they like at young ages so that when you get into these intimate relationships, you don't have to sit down and just say, hmm, what do I like? Or why don't I like that? Like you can have that dialogue already. And then, of course, knowing proper terms for your body parts and being able to articulate that at a young age as a protective factor and to help with conversations later on with your parents or whatever nurturing environment that you're in. So when you are working with clients, and Tanya, do you primarily do more kind of speaking to large groups? Do you work with like individuals or couples? Tell me a little bit more about like how you work. So I primarily do large groups, Mm -hmm. whether they're sexual health professionals themselves or aspiring to be college students, also faith community, like congregants and, and different religious groups around the area, primarily Christian for for my work and my perspective. So I do a lot of large groups, or at least when I say large, like more than at least 10 people or something like that. I have done some one-on-one counseling. So I applaud therapists. I just don't believe I have the capacity to do that because I'm such an empath. Like I want to fix everything (laughs) and cry with you and all of that. But I feel like I can do good at counseling. So I have some counseling certifications specifically around HIV too, 
So I'm able to do that. So I do some one-on-one, but mainly large groups. Got it. And where do you typically start with that work? Like, what do you feel like is foundational to know when you're working with like a large group? I think that you have to know thyself. I'm doing my research on comfort and capability with community-based sexuality educators. Like in order for you to do this well, and even if you're not degree, like whoever you are, if this is a conversation you want to have with folks, you have to be comfortable in who you are and also know that there's some blind spots within yourself. So somebody could say, like I used to think no one can say anything because I've seen it all, heard it all, said it all. And then you have that moment where you're like, ooh, but that was that threw me for a loop. So I think being able to know who you are in your own sexual beingness is important. You don't have to share that with folks, but be comfortable in who you are. Mm -hmm. Got you. So is there a spectrum as it relates to sexual health or sexuality that is healthy versus unhealthy? Or do we not want to look at things related to sexuality as unhealthy? A lot of people are in the viewpoint of not necessarily unhealthy. Mm-hmm. And I, even we even play around with like what's safe, right? And safer. Mm-hmm. And it's challenging because I'm from the, the thought of just let people be. Mm-hmm. With the exception of causing unwanted harm mm-hmm. to someone else, harming children, you know, anything that doesn't involve consent, Mm -hmm. I think can be healthy. Like there's some things you just like Mm -hmm. and you just want. And then there are other things that you might be willing to compromise and try just out of curiosity. I think when it thinks about healthy, when it's causing yourself or somebody else unwanted harm. Mm -hmm. Got you. Got you. That makes sense. Yeah. But I mean, because, you know, if we think about like just the history of, you know, mental health diagnosis and like things that have been deemed, quote unquote, unhealthy or abnormal, we know that where we were as a field even 20, 30 years ago is not where we are today. Right. And so I do think it's important to not kind of demonize or, you know, make something seem abnormal simply because it's what someone enjoys. Right. you know, barring the exceptions that you've listed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So something else that I think that we don't talk enough about are people who maybe identify as asexual or aromantic. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so it's interesting that you bring that up because when we, when I'm teaching especially and folks are talking about just overall sexual identity and what that includes, so that includes your attraction, how you identify, maybe if you use the term orientation, et cetera. And so even when we're talking about orientation and using acronyms like LGBTQIA and then everybody's like, what's the A? And, you know, and then some folks will say ally and other folks will say asexual. And then that piques another level of curiosity. And so I think with asexuality, it's something that I think has gotten more attention and I want to believe, although I have no research to confirm this, that it's allowing people a little bit of affirmation of why they might not have been attracted to someone in a certain way while their other people have been, if that makes sense. Like sometimes Mm -hmm. you just wonder what's wrong with you or what's going on because it seems like you're different than everyone else. And I think having conversations about asexuality is important and even a romantic. So not having that romantic attraction to other folks. I'm going to use this because I don't know if we can say it, but you can tell me And that one of my former students just posted about girlfriends. So, you know, girlfriends is on Netflix right yes. now. Uh-huh. And so they posted about Lynn and William started having sex. Mm-hmm. And they were just like, I just wish that never happened. Although I remember well, maybe one episode where it got complicated. For the most part, it was kind of like neither one of them were romantically attracted to each other, but they were fulfilling sexual needs that we have as human beings for one another. And I know other folks may say, well, that crosses the line of our friendship, but there were two consenting adults and they were getting parts of their sexual needs met without a romantic attraction to one another. And I think that also is something people didn't see in the story because it just seemed like there was more a line of the friends with benefits Mm-hmm. Then it was about Lynn and William getting their sexual needs met in that capacity. 
And you are seeing those as two different things. Because I think that's how I would have thought about it, too, as like a friends with benefits. Yeah, I'm seeing those as two different things only because there's an opportunity for romantic attraction in my mind with friends with benefits. Some people do come to an agreement, but I feel like Lynn and William had a clear agreement that sometimes friends with benefits have too many unspoken rules. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely would agree with that. (laughs) And we've talked about that on the podcast too, like how to assess whether that is something that you really want to get involved in and like knowing all the benefits and the risks that you're taking in a relationship like that. Right. Yeah, yeah. I had forgotten that William and Lynn slept together. And now I'm still in the middle of my rewatch, but I'm trying to think about like, how was that handled when William and Joan started dating? I don't remember if there was any conversation about the fact that William and Lynn had been together. And I'm not sure either. Now I have to go back to it. <laughs> yeah, because I don't know. Was it public among the friend group that William and Lynn were getting together? Now that I can't remember, but I feel like. At least Maya knew. I feel like Maya Mm. knew, and I can't remember why or how she might have found out. Hmm. Because I feel like, I think she used to say, like, somebody was nasty. Like, so I feel like she (laughs) called Yeah, Maya did say that quite a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so stay tuned for the answers to these questions after we finish (laughs) rewatching. Exactly. So you talked earlier, Tanya, about like the importance of even talking to young people about like enjoying things like ice cream and, you know, that kind of thing. But I'm wondering, as we grow up, are there other things that we need to think about that would help to create an environment for positive sexual experiences and pleasure? I do. I think that we need to think about and I'm just really about introspection and reflection. So thinking about why you might not like a certain thing or why you're desirous of something and being able to articulate. I know in my at least small circle of even friends and colleagues, some of the biggest challenges has been around communicating with their partners and being able to articulate kind of the why, not necessarily that you have to explain to someone something, but to really reflect on what could be some of the reasons that I don't like a certain behavior or that I really, really desire this more than I can articulate. So being able to reflect, I think when we look back on our childhood, when we look back on past relationships, we can get a better understanding as to the why, and then we can communicate that. And I think that when we go into new relationships, especially as as adults, if we've had like that past, you take those past relationship expectations into the new relationship sometimes and you expect someone to kiss you, hold you, respond to you, or even understand your love languages the way that someone else did. And that could be very disappointing. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm glad you talked about the communication piece, because I do think that is something that comes up often in our community about like how to even maybe tell a partner that you maybe have a kink that might not be something that, you know, people expect. Right. So do you have tips for how to maybe negotiate those conversations? I think I will call it the before the lights go off, although lights don't always go off, you know, but just having like a, a chat to say, What is it that you like? Or have you tried this? And sometimes you may have to use a crutch. But maybe you say, I saw this on TV. Mm. I was wondering if, you know, you like this or would you want to try this? I feel like my community oftentimes are very, and it is private, right? But I, I feel like they don't often embrace something that isn't just standard, what you've seen on TV or read in a book or tried yourself. So anything that other people, or if you haven't experienced it, it's seen as taboo or freaky. Like we like to use the term freaky in my small community when it's kind of like, no, it's just different. So it doesn't make it wrong. It's just different or it's new to you. And so being able to like ask people to, to take risk with you. So vulnerability And risk taking, if we go back to that circles model, is within the circle of intimacy. Think how risky it is to tell someone about one of your fetishes, like you are getting that close to them and you want to experience that with them or just disclose it to them. That's risky emotionally and is a level of vulnerability that is really important to relationships, too. 
I'm trying to keep track of all my thoughts because you said so many good things that I'm trying to connect Sorry. now. And I'm like, no, I don't want to lose that thought. But that what you just said helped me. And I've, like I said, I've not seen this model that you're talking about. So it sounds like some of the circles overlap, but it does feel like there is an important conversation to have around the intimacy piece and then the pleasure because it does feel like people will often be very comfortable like just getting naked and having sex, right? But those conversations that you're talking about that really deepen intimacy are much more difficult for people than sometimes just the act of sex. Exactly. I wholeheartedly agree with that. And is there a way that you need to do some work around the intimacy to really enhance pleasure? I think when you start connecting and like sharing Communication, again, is not just about articulating your your needs, you know, it's also about being able to share and connect. And so that allows you when you're able to like, I'll use the term, let your guard down or let somebody in into you, then I think that that's what facilitates that. I think you're able to gain that level of trust. And to be quite honest, I I had a conversation with my class and they were saying, well, how long does that take? (laughs) And to be quite honest, it could take someone like a couple of hours. I don't know, because of the connection they have with somebody where it might take somebody else a few years or months to actually get to that place. Mm hmm. And another thing that often comes up in our community, Tanya, and you've kind of touched on this a little bit, is having conversations about STIs, right? And so if you've been diagnosed with something and you're like in a partnership or if you have a history of a diagnosis and are newly dating, like when do you share that? How do you share? I'm curious to hear if you have any tips about that. Yeah, now that's a big topic. So I came into this work, like I said, doing HIV and STI prevention testing and and counseling. And it's so much stigma around having an STD. Like we've been socialized to think somebody is either clean or dirty and dirty meaning they have an STI. But probably when we think about it, the majority of people at least have had one or been exposed to it. I I just can't, I I probably shouldn't go that far because I don't have the data in front of me, but I feel confident that that's how easy some things are actually transmitted from person to person. And some of them are STIs like herpes that can be transmitted in a non-sexual sense, Mm -hmm. you know, like from mother to child or something like that. And I just feel like our work has been so rooted on this is a bad thing. It's something that you don't necessarily want, but it's not necessarily like you, this is the worst thing in, for some people that can happen. And I know I'm saying that from a very strange perspective, but hear me out in that I worked in a student health center on a college campus. I worked in a local health department and I work in a community based uh, organization where people were diagnosed with HIV, gonorrhea, chlamydia, all the things. And I think more so on the college campus, nobody wanted to come to student health just because we offered STI testing. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, that assumption of if you're in student health, then you must have something because that's primarily what we did. And so we had to let people know that our services were for everybody, try to change the community or the culture of the campus to even offer up the STI testing is also a prevention method as well. So if you know what your test results are, know your status, then you're less likely to pass it on to somebody else. To get that into the world, it was hard on the campus, but to get that mindset in the world is even harder because we say such negative things about folks when they do have a diagnosis. So it makes it hard for them to share with other people, and to sometimes even seek treatment for whatever it is that they have. Hmm. Yeah, I've worked on college campuses as well and completely understand what you're talking about, you know, and it does take a lot of effort to really kind of push that conversation forward around. There are lots of different reasons why you could be in student health that don't involve necessarily an STI or testing. But even if that's the case, then making it okay to kind of be in charge of your own health information, like to be armed with facts so that you can then make decisions accordingly. And I have some friends who are both sexuality educators and have disclosed publicly their STI status. 
And from their perspective, they encourage people to be open and honest to kind of normalize the conversation, period. Mm -hmm. So not only are you able to, when we're talking about like how soon can you gain trust, you know, it also boosts up that trust factor because you just shared this thing with me. You trusted me enough to do it. And as the relationship continues to grow, if it does, it also allows for communication to say, well, I'm not afraid to talk about STIs or HIV with you because we already started out the conversation this way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm curious, Tanya, have you seen any similarities between kind of what's happening even with COVID testing and relating it to STI testing? It feels like there's some of that same stigma. Sadly, it is. So again, using my family and they know who they are. (laughs) Um, Ultimately, with our family not having conversations with our cousins who were infected with HIV in past, we had the same situation where there were cousins who had COVID, but they didn't tell anyone. And they were still not, I don't say social distancing, they were supposed to be quarantining Mm -hmm. and social isolating. And they're just going around still visiting people or running a public facing business instead of telling people and you know trying to figure out and I I struggle with it because I'm like well here's a business owner if you have COVID then you have no business you have no income but at the same time you're putting other people at risk and it was just a secrecy around it and it finally just came out Mm -hmm. and we don't even know if the whole story is out right but a lot of that is going on because there's a there is a stigma with any condition, except I don't ever remember anybody asking, like, how did you get cancer? Mm-hmm. But I feel like people will ask you, even with COVID, how did you get it? Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. they want to know what were you doing right. that put you at risk? So that will be the same way as like, what were you doing sexually that put you at risk for whatever disease or infection? Mm hmm. And I'm wondering, Tanya, and I know that much of that reaction, of course, is a way to kind of protect ourselves. Right. So if if you, you know, were infected with COVID and there was something that you were doing that was risky, then I feel better about myself because I didn't do that risky thing. Of course, not, under, you know, knowing that we can get COVID very simply, even if we do everything that we can um, to try to protect ourselves. And so I'm wondering how we can kind of expand our thinking from it being a personal responsibility to more of a system kind of a thing with both with COVID and STIs. Yeah, I think the system's approach is to be able to normalize the fact that some people are going to get sick with different things, whether it's COVID or an STI. But we can lessen that when we're able to talk about it. Mm-hmm. So think how much communication was needed to combat or, you know, when we first heard about COVID, it was we weren't give, even given a lot of the information. There was still information with hells, I believe, from us. And so the same thing happens when we're talking about STIs or HIV. So if we were able to normalize having the conversations, not demonizing folks who were either infected or, you know, coming or in treatment or care for different conditions, I think that would help build that space for combating it because now we're having conversations like, well, you know what? I'd love to have sex with you tonight, but I'm taking, I don't know, the medication from my chlamydia. I need to wait until I'm done with that before we can engage. By the way, let's talk about how you protect yourself from STIs or et cetera. Have you ever been tested? You know, it seems weird to ask people. We get on that scale. As soon as we go to the doctor's office, we get on a scale, we urinate in a cup. And I don't think there's any anxiety around telling somebody that's what you do when you go to the doctor's office. But if you start asking about STI testing, a lot of people do feel weird about it, even if they're negative, because it's almost like you're insinuating Mm -hmm. that they might have something. Mm -hmm. So your stance is really to just kind of make this a part of your regular kind of dating conversations. And I'm guessing probably not first date, unless you know you're going to sleep with the person, right? But, you know, just in casual dating right that that you start to have some of these conversations pretty early when it looks like you may even be heading towards becoming intimate with one another physically intimate I think so because I even think about when you go on a job interview not that they ask you like inappropriate or frustrating questions but they do ask you all these questions and you have to decide and they have to decide do you have to decide if they hire you are you going to take the job and they have to decide based on your answers 
do they want to hire you? I feel like that's kind of the perspective. It's like, let's just ask some hard questions mm-hmm. and make some hard decisions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and I think I see this most often with diagnoses like maybe herpes or HIV, ones that are not, you know, necessarily easily controlled or like there's a medication you can take for seven days and then you don't have to worry about it. Would you still suggest people being open about that very early in relationships? I think with HIV in particular, and I feel like both are stigmatized. And that's how I started, like I said, getting into the holistic area of sexuality is that with HIV, there's a lot of risk of disclosing that can be detrimental. So not saying that it wouldn't happen with herpes. There's your voluntary disclosure of it Mm -hmm. with the intimate partner. But then there's an involuntary disclosure that you can't control. Should you break up? Should they decide not to continue, you know, seeing you, even if it's like on the first date? So like that requires for some people a level of critical thinking to say, am I willing to take this risk? Because they're going to be the pros and the cons with disclosing for any condition. And I think any person has to be at a place where they are willing to at least sit down and address the cons, knowing you might not be able to prevent them. Mm hmm. Got you. Got you. Okay. So you started talking earlier, Tanya, about like the level of introspection and reflection that you need to do to kind of really be able to approach this work. And I know something else that has come up in our community often is the faith roots, like you talked about, right? And how so much of faith and religion in a lot of ways, I think for a lot of us has really kind of gone against sexuality and sexual Mm -hmm. pleasure specifically. And so I'm wondering if there are some questions or ways to start digging into that for yourself, if that is something that you're really struggling with. So having trouble kind of engaging with sexual pleasure because of like religion and spirituality. Yeah, I think for that, it's like that values reflection of, of why do I feel this way? What bothers me about it? What scares me about it? We do something in sexuality education called a sexual attitude reassessment, a SAR. I don't know if you've heard of it, Mm -hmm. but it forces you. Well, I don't say force, but you go through it willingly, but it addresses topics that might be seen as triggering or offensive or, you know, different or challenging. And I think going through something like that, not as a sexuality professional, because you can, you can do it for a professional or people who just want to process some things for themselves can go through one, but it forces you to face kind of the things that you're most uncomfortable with. And then how do they reconcile with why you feel that way? So in my experience, when I think about, let's say, same gender loving couples and some of the people I know in my faith community, that's a challenge for them. So then asking them, so what is it about that that challenges you? Like what happened or what have you heard or seen that made you feel this way about this type of relationship? What does it do for you in terms of emotional and and vulnerability and just sitting down and having those conversations with yourself. That's kind of where I am with it. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you shared that, Tanya, because I wasn't aware that like people who were not training to be like a sex therapist or a sexual sexuality educator could do a SARS. Yeah, they have. I forget. There were two places, of course, COVID, Mm -hmm. but there were two places I want to say like Vermont up that way. And then someone had one in the South or in Philadelphia, the Philadelphia area too. I think Widener was uh, connected to that one. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you could do that and mm-hmm. you can process some things. Now, I, I'm pretty sure we don't have hundreds of people w- go, wanting to go to it because it's pretty intense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So are there pieces of it that you could maybe think about for yourself if you can't necessarily afford to do that? Or I would imagine also, I don't know the two that you're speaking of, but I would imagine there are some cultural pieces to sexuality that we would want to make sure that are a part of that conversation for it to be a safe place to engage. Oh, absolutely. And there are some SARS, well, again, I'm going to professional now, but, you know, people can create them where it's for Black, Indigenous, and other people of color only, nice. or making sure that you address culture and intersectionality within the SAR. And that's one of the huge things. Um, I have some colleagues, that's their only SAR that they conduct, 
because the lack of inclusion in sexuality work and the whitewashing of sexuality overall. And so that's their main intent when they're doing SARS. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad that people are offering those. And I would imagine that maybe even some other sexuality educators or sex therapists maybe do this work as a part of like the work they do with individual clients or maybe smaller groups. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Tanya, I want to also hear just because I'm not as familiar and I have little ones, so they're four and six. So, you know, have really just kind of starting school. But I think about my own education, like with health education, right? Like thinking about that one circle that you talked about, right? In terms of (laughs) reproductive health and sexual health. I'm curious to know if we are seeing advancements in terms of like health classes or like what kinds of curriculums are are they being shared in schools that have a much more sex positive focus well joy there's good news and there's bad news (laughs) and and this is the honest truth so i don't know if you want the good news or the bad news but (laughs) let's start with the good news okay so the good news is from an overall standpoint in my experience the curriculum are not or curriculum are not changing mm-hmm. per se. Like there's been advancements even here in North Carolina. When I was doing some work with working at the Department of Education, 2009, our standards changed for reproductive health and safety education. But ultimately, that's just a small bit of it. And a lot of the evidence based curricula that's being used in communities and schools you know, that stuff was published and set out in the 90s and the early 2000s. So it's it's not as inclusive. It's not as affirming. The good news on that is that educators are realizing that these are the things that they're mandated and required to teach, but they're learning for themselves how to be more sex positive, how to be inclusive, how to change language with keeping still of the fidelity portion of the materials that they're using, but expanding it so that it's more holistic in their teaching. So it's really about the teacher themselves than it is about the actual materials that are out there. But then with the advent of like, well, I'm saying the advent, but the use of technology and expanding technology, there are like online portals that people can use, videos, podcasts, et cetera now. Mm -hmm. So basically what you're saying is that if we want to make sure that the young people in our lives have a more sex positive approach to sexuality or more positive approach to sexuality, it's really going to be on us to make sure that we're sharing materials and books and videos and those kinds of things to start those conversations because it's unlikely they'll get it in schools. Right. And I always use this analogy because I'm horrible at math. But I say in North Carolina, we have 115 school districts. So if you multiply that by the number of schools that actually are teaching this content, multiply that by the number of teachers who are actually providing it, then that's the number of ways you're actually going to get sexuality education in the Mm -hmm. state because it's Mm going to always land with what the teacher can and feel supported and is knowledgeable in doing all the way up to the superintendent of the school district supporting them doing it. Got it. Got it. So Tanya, can you share any resources that you really enjoy for people who maybe want to dig more into some of the things that you've talked about today? I really like books. So Mm -hmm. I have, I feel like my library is extensive because I like old books. So like right now I'm reading a book from 1983 on sexuality just to see how things have evolved. So those are some good books. But I know you have my colleague, Dr. Lex James. She has a cool book that's for children Mm -hmm. on teaching about body parts. I also, I'm I'm looking over there now uh, to see like there's like volumes of books around sex and how it's changed. So I think books are a good resource. And I also like reflecting back on old sitcoms. So like we were talking about girlfriends, but like good times is a classic way to like discuss sex and sexuality with various people because there were so many um, episodes that really looked at gender and um, representation, et cetera. So 
I hate to say TV, but TV is also a good way to do that. So now I am very curious to hear some examples from Good Times because there's so many episodes, but I don't think I've ever looked at it through like a sexuality or kind of information lens in that way. So can you give me an example of something that you might use from Good Times? Oh, yeah. So there was one episode where, what's his name? Philip Michael Thomas was in it and he was dating Thelma. He was a college student working on either his dissertation or thesis. I believe that thesis title was something similar to like Black Sexuality in the Ghetto Girl or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it was a conversation of Thelma was reading it, but her father, James, saw it and thought it was okay because he thought JJ was reading it. Mm -hmm. And he was even okay, although Michael was younger, that it might have been Michael reading it. But he flipped his lid when he found out Thelma was reading it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that played out like the gender dynamics around that. So like when I see some of those episodes, I like try to dig deep. And plus Mm -hmm. I see myself as a black woman in Thelma, (laughs) Wilona Mm -hmm. and Florida. Like it's like, that's all the people that were in my life at Mm -hmm. the time. And I see myself in them. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is interesting to kind of look at some things that we looked at when we were maybe younger and now you know, from an older approach and through a professional lens, right? Because of course your work then informs how you're, you know, viewing media, which is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Appreciate you sharing that. So anything else that you want to share with the audience, Tanya, any other resources and definitely share with us where we can find you online as well as any social media handles. Oh yes. So some great resources include sex positive families for those who have young people and kiddos in their life so that they can have conversations, especially as a trusted adult or most importantly, parents, because that is a lot of stress, especially now with COVID. Afrosexology is a great resource too. I like to use some of their worksheets when I'm talking about pleasure and kind of that conversation is like, what do you like and what you don't like or your fetishes and your fantasies. So Afrosexology, those are my main Go to ones, mm-hmm. and my contact information is tanyambass.com. And I put videos up there, but you definitely can contact me and get information up from me and on Instagram as well. Perfect. Well, we appreciate you sharing that, Tanya. And I appreciate, you know, you and Afrosexology and uh, Sex Positive Families because something you said earlier around like using, oh, I saw this on TV, you know, is this something that you want to try? I really feel like the work that you all do gives people that in, right? So if I see a sex educator share something on Instagram, then that's an easy thing for me to show to my partner and say, oh, did you see this thing that, you know, Tanya was talking about? Maybe this is something that we can try. So I do think it makes you know, sexual education, just much more accessible for people and gives them language, you know, that they might not have had otherwise. Absolutely. That's so true. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for sharing with us. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm so glad Tanya was able to share her expertise with us today. To learn more about her and her work, be sure to visit the show notes at therapyforblackgirls.com slash session 174. And don't forget to grab your tickets to join us Friday night for our Sex Positive September celebration at sexpositiveseptember.com. If you're looking for a therapist in your area, be sure to check out our therapist directory at therapyforblackgirls.com slash directory. And if you want to continue digging into this topic and connect with some other sisters in your area, come on over and join us in the Yellow Couch Collective where we take a deeper dive into the topics from the podcast and just about everything else. You can join us at therapyforblackgirls.com slash YCC. Don't forget that if you're looking for a way to end summer on a high note, Cricket Wireless has got just the thing. Get ready for unlimited smiles, unlimited times four. Get four lines of unlimited data for $100 a month. Thank y'all so much for joining me again this week. I look forward to continuing this conversation with you all real soon.